Okay, guys, this is an all-new episode of the Bangers of Mass Show. I am Mr. Banger, a.k.a. Zach. This is my co-host, Mr. Mash, JD. This is the Bangers and Mash Show, the podcast nobody listens to or likes. Tonight's episode, we're returning to horror. You know what one of the most consistent concepts in the horror genre is? Ghost movies. Yes, ghost stories. And it predates film, obviously, the concept of telling spooky ghost stories around (gasps) a campfire. You don't say. I know. I think I blew the audience's mind when I said that. So good you're here to explain that to them? I live to serve, mostly myself, but occasionally somebody else. Anyway, you know what's interesting about the ghost story as a genre is that right now it's pretty much the only money-making genre for horror at the moment. You don't say. There are ghost movies coming out the wazoo. There are several coming out this year. Now, isn't that interesting? What do you think that says about the age we're living in right now, that ghost stories are the most popular type of horror film currently? Americans are a bunch of pussies. Insightful. So what I've done, as always, I've built a list of classic and not-so-classic ghost stories and haunted house movies and things of that nature. Let's get started. The first movie on our list is a film that I really feel defines the haunted house genre and really popularized the haunted house genre because before this, ghost stories were not as frequent. After this, you started seeing a lot more of them. And that is, of course, Robert Wise's 1963 classic, The Haunting. Now, you've never seen this movie, J.D. I've seen the remake. Does that count? We'll talk about the remake in a second. The original is uh, an incredibly spooky movie. I talk on the show a lot about atmosphere. <laughs> oh my god! And this film is heavy in atmosphere. First off, the film has brilliant sound design. You don't say. There's a scene where the main character is walking up this rickety spiral staircase, and the way that moment builds and builds and builds until the climax, and it's strictly pretty much just climax. through sound design. And the use of shadows in this film are incredible. Really, this is a movie that's all about what you don't don't see. It's all about suggestion and atmosphere, and that's why The Haunting from 1963 is a great horror movie, and it has a wonderful ending. It's a very mythic film. It builds on mythology. I like it a lot, and I need to see it. I haven't seen it in a while, but I remember loving it. It's something I don't own, and you definitely need to buy it. So you need to see 1963's The Howling. The Haunting. Fuck. You need to see that movie. (laughs) I saw that movie. No, you need to see this movie. (laughs) The remake from 1999 is pretty much the opposite of that in that it's a special effects movie and you see everything. I still thought it was a decent movie. I mean, it's not the greatest movie ever made. It's got Liam Neeson in it. Hey, not Luke Wilson. The one nobody cares about. No, it is Luke Wilson. Is it Luke Wilson? Owen. Owen Wilson. Owen Wilson's the blonde. Luke is the dark-haired one. Luke is the one without the flat nose, right? Right, right, right. And Owen Wilson gets his head torn off by a gargoyle in this movie. No. Yeah. It's the pendulum in the fireplace. Well, there's a... Yeah, but it's like a giant gargoyle on a chain. It's a lion pendulum. Right, it's a lion, and it takes its head off, and its head is in the lion's mouth. Recently, because I haven't seen it since it first came out, how do the special effects hold up? Because if I remember, there was a lot of CGI in this movie. It's about half and half. Some of it still looks really good, and then some of it's like wow, we have come a long way. A lot of the parts where you see the fingers of the house coming down, all that still looks really good. Mm. But what about the billy, smoky ghost man at the end of the movie? Coming down the stairs. Remember how it looked from Scary Movie 2? (laughs) (laughs) No, I've never actually seen Scary Movie 2. I haven't seen Scary Movie 2. I've seen... How have we been friends for 11 years? I've seen parts of it on TV, but I've never seen Scary Movie 2 in its unedited form. And I'm assuming a lot got cut out for television because the movie's filthy, even in the cut version. Anyway, The Haunting from 1999. I haven't seen this movie in a long time. When I saw it, I was young and dumb. I kind of liked it. So I'm assuming if I saw it now, I'd probably not like it, especially since I've seen the original, which was such an effective film. However, the score, which I believe is a Jerry Goldsmith score. I remember thinking that was pretty good. Yes, and, it was. And Catherine Zeta-Jones plays a lesbian. Catherine Zeta-Jones is already hot. Yeah, Catherine Zeta-Jones during her peak hotness. And, of course, that character in the original was just suggested. There was a suggestion of a romantic attraction between her and the heroine of the story. And in the remake, they pretty much flat-out state that she's bisexual, at least. I don't know. It's directed by the guy who did Speed and Twister. It's a popcorn movie. It's not really a horror film. Speaking of older movies that were remade in the 90s, remade in the same year. Next up on the list is House on Haunted Hill from 1959. Now, you've seen the original House on Haunted Hill, yes, right? Yes, I've seen both versions of this. Okay, and I've only seen the original, and it's actually been quite some time. I do remember a couple of things. First off, I remember the opening where a bunch of people's heads are superimposed over a picture of the house, and they're telling us about mm-hmm. the plot. I remember Vincent Price being delightful, as always, and I remember the one scene that everybody remembers from this movie, where they're in the basement, and they look up, and there's a scary old woman in front of their faces, which was kind of like the original 
original jump scare, one of them had to be, early in the history of the jump scare. I remember a pit of acid in the basement. Now, is any of that stuff in the remake from, also from 1999? There is a pit of acid, but it's not the same. It was an okay movie, but I, I really don't like it. If I don't like it, I know you'll hate it. Isn't a Jeffrey Rush in this filling the Vincent Price role? Yes. That is the only Jeffrey Rush part that I have seen him in that I did not like. Oh, really? Now that surprises me. You're a Jeffrey Rush fanboy. <laughs> no, I'm not really a fanboy. <laughs> he was cool as Casanova Frankenstein. And he makes a great pirate. And he makes an awesome pirate. <laughs> Have you seen Jeffrey Rush in that Cowboys vs. Ninjas movie? I think it's yes. called The Last Warrior. What, what's yes, it? Yes, I've seen that. Is it any good? It's pretty cool. Really? Because it looked it's, like it could go either way. It, it's Cowboys vs. Ninjas. Actually. Okay, well, I mean, there's a certain appeal to that. I think it's The Last Warrior or Warrior or something. Something like that. Anyway, that's off topic. I haven't seen the remake. I've seen a couple of the other Dark Castle remakes, and I wasn't a real big fan of them, so I'm assuming I'm probably not going to be a real big fan of this. However, I do know that it has Lisa Loeb in it. Back during her peak hot so, you know, I might give it a look. And there's a sequel well, to that. Well, it also has Allie Ardner or whatever her name Oh, is. Allie Larder from Heroes and Final Destination? Yeah, Nation. she's in that. Famke. Oh, Famke Junctions. Yeah. Jean Grey. <laughs> Yeah. Jean Grey and Xiana on a top for you James Bond fanboys. There's a sequel to this movie. I believe it's called Return to House on Haunted Hill. Mm-hmm. Oh, you've seen it. Mm-hmm. Oh, you haven't seen it. No, I've seen it. <laughs> oh, it's a piece of shit. Uh, it was a sci-fi movie. Well, actually, it was a direct-to-video release, and I remember reading about this movie when it came out in Fangoria, and I talked about how the DVD was going to be set up so the audience could pick the progression of the story. It was going to be like a choose-your-own-adventure book in movie form. I mean, do you know anything about that, or did you see it on television? I saw it on television. And it was shitty. It was shitty. Is this a remake in name only? Because it's set in a haunted insane asylum or something, right? It was originally a, an insane asylum. That's completely different. That's not from the original at all. Yeah, in the original, it's a hotel, isn't it? Yeah, it's just a house. In the remake, it's a hotel, but before okay. it was a hotel, it was an insane asylum. Right. So does this have anything to do with the original, aside from the people are invited to stay in a haunted house for money overnight premise? Well, they get a gun in a coffin, and okay. the wife commits suicide. Okay. It, she doesn't hang herself. Just for those who don't know this, the 1959 original is in the public domain, so you can watch it for free on the internet anywhere. Any video site's going to have it. So, moving on to 1961, as you can already see, the late 50s, early 60s, there was a, a big interest to ghosts during that period, and I don't know if that was in any sort of historical context, or if people were just sick of the classic monsters, but weren't ready for the harder horror that would come later in the decade. 1961, The Innocence, which is a wonderfully psychological movie, could sort of interpret it in a way that it isn't even a ghost story. Now, you haven't seen this movie. No, I have not. Okay, well, what's it about? It takes place in the 1800s. It's based off a novel called Turn of the Screw, which is kind of to ghost stories what Dracula is to vampires, so very influential. And the premise is that this woman has been hired as the caretaker and a nanny to this big gothic manor, specifically to take care of the two kids. The little boy was, was also in the original Village of the Damned. So you, you, when you see him, you'll know him. He's got the blonde hair and those big eyes. But the I've whole... Never seen the original Village of the Damned. You've never seen the original Village of the Damned? No. Oh, I'll have to make you watch that. In the Innocence, um, Deborah Keir plays the caretaker that's come to this gothic manor to take care of these two kids. And the previous two caretakers have died. And throughout the film, Deborah Keir's character comes to believe that the spirits of the previous two caretakers have started to possess the two children. Uh-oh. For a film made in 1961, it's pretty daring stuff. The film never comes out and says what kind of things the two previous caretakers got into, but there's a heavy suggestion that there was some weird sex stuff going on there. Sometimes the kids act in ways that... Kids shouldn't act? Yeah, and the way it's done is pretty disturbing. But what's wonderful about this film is it really is set up in a way where you can think that there really is something supernatural going on here. Or it is Deborah Kerr's character, who is a very religious woman and a very restrained sort of woman. Her sexual hang manifesting themselves psychologically. Left ambiguous. The film never comes out and tells you which is which. In fact, the ending is very ambiguous. It's a wonderful film. It builds to a, a great intensity in the last 15 minutes. And there is a sequence where the woman is hiding behind a curtain and a face appears outside the window behind her and then the face comes through the window at her. Pretty spooky stuff. The guy who did the cinematography of this film, Freddie Francis, would go on to direct many of the great Amicus and Hammer Horror movies. So uh, I highly recommend The Innocent. Everybody who's interested in ghost stories should give it a look. Is this color or black and white? It's black and white. It's definitely black and white. So I'm going to watch it. Oh, God. Have you seen the next movie on the list, too? <laughs> 
know. You'll have to explain it to me. Okay, so Legend of Hell House from 1973. Sounds familiar. It has a very similar premise to The Haunting in that it's about a group of paranormal investigators going into a house that is well known for its haunting. In The Haunting, it was Hull House, and in The Legend of Hell House, it's Belesco House. And this film was written by Richard Matheson, who wrote I Am Legend and many great memorable episodes of The Twilight Zone, including the one with William Shatner and The Thing on the Plane. Richard Matheson wrote The Legend of Hell House. And it's an interesting film because it sort of examines ghosts from a psychological standpoint. Something the film does is sort of suggest that at the end of the film it provides a very Freudian reason why the spirit is staying around and haunting. And the ghost in this movie is very sexual. One of the infamous scenes in this film is Pamela Franklin, who is very attractive, is actually raped by the ghost of the deviant evil old man who is haunting his house. And the main scientist's wife is overwhelmed at one point and tries to seduce him and strips off her clothes. It stars Roddy McDowell, who's very good in this. He has a wonderful scene where he's sitting in a chair in his room and then starts to freak out because he's mentally battling with the ghost. Do you think you've seen this movie or not? It sounds familiar, but it must have been a movie I've seen oh, oh. like years ago. Okay, there's the scene with the cat, where the black cat jumps into why Pamela Franklin's in the shower and scratches up her back. That's like the most famous scene in the movie. They made fun of it in Scary Movie 2. Is that where that's from? Yes, you remember the cat in Scary Movie 2, but you don't remember Legend of Hell House. <laughs> Anyway, Legend of Hell House is pretty good. It's not as good as The Haunting, and it owes a lot to The Haunting. I would recommend it. It has a wonderful opening scene where they're walking into the house, and it's covered in fog, and there's a cat right in the foreground. It's a very famous shot. I enjoyed that film. So here's another movie you haven't seen. You need to see more horror movies from the 70s, dude. <laughs> Most of them are crap. That's not true. There were a lot of really good horror movies made in the 70s. In fact, I have a book called Horror Films of the 1970s. I can show you how many good ones there are. I mean, there's like Werewolf in London. Or that's the 80s. American Werewolf in London. That was made in the 80s. Was it made in the 80s? That was made in 81, I think. Oh, so it barely counts as the <laughs> 80s. It's very much an 80s movie. We're not talking about werewolves. We're talking about ghosts. This was almost a werewolf episode. From 1976, Burnt Offerings, and you haven't seen this one. No, it's on Netflix. I'll watch it. It stars, uh, it stars Karen Black from the Trilogy of Terror and House of a Thousand Corpses, so you know who she is, right? I know who she is from House of a Thousand Corpses. Okay, well, you've seen Trilogy of Terror, though, right? Maybe. The Zuni fetish doll? And... Oh, the spear? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've seen Also it. a Richard Matheson movie. It all comes full. It all circle. goes back to Richard Matheson. It's got Oliver Reed in it. It's got Betty Davis in it, one of her later period films. It's an interesting subversion on the haunted house formula because it's not about a haunted house. It's about a house that haunts people. The house itself is a living thing. The film begins with Karen Black and Oliver Reed are a married couple. They have a grandmother and then a young son. They decide to take care of this mansion over the summer, and it's a very big, opulent mansion, and it's owned by these two elderly siblings, one of which is Burgess Meredith. You know, the penguin. Really? Why? Well, I, 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 told me I that. never know if you know who an actor Don't is. Don't think I know who Burgess Meredith is. <laughs> I used to watch the Batman show religiously. <laughs> asshole. Anyway, they're being basically paid money to take care of this huge mansion, and they think it's a deal that's too good to be true. Well, it is. Da, da, da. One of the conditions of them taking care of the house over the summer is that they have to take care of these elderly siblings that own the house. Their mother, who you think must be even older, supposedly lives in the attic bedroom, and they have to take care of her. However, you never see mother, you never hear any footsteps or anything, and basically the gist of the movie is that Karen Black, the wife, becomes obsessed with the house. Father very soon figures out that something weird is going on, and that it's having a negative effect on him and the son and the stepmother. And then some strange things begin to happen. So it's like a Friday the Dark, but with a boy. No fairies. I mean, I don't know. The films do have a little bit in common, but I wouldn't say it's really not too much, because when I say the house is alive, that really is sort of a key word in this film. And the house starts out decrepit, and it begins to become newer seeming as the film goes on, and the family suffers more. There's a wonderful sequence in this film where Oliver Reed flashes back to the funeral of his mother, and at this funeral, there was a chauffeur driving the hearse, and the chauffeur looked out the window and gave him this great big toothy grin. It's the cheapest special effect, because because there's nothing obviously sinister about that, but it's really spooky, and it builds to a wonderful sequence. I recommend Burnt Offerings. It's a slow film, but it has a great ending. The ending is very downbeat and rather brutal. I don't know if you'd like it, but I dig Burnt Offerings. I would recommend it. Okay, this next movie you have seen. Yeah, yeah. Now we're on Amityville Horror. Okay. From 1979, Amityville Horror. Okay, so people buy a house. House is haunted. 
<laughs> house comes alive, walls bleed, and they end up running away and then have to come back for the dog and then run away again. So, and the statue bites him. In the book, yeah. In the movie, he trips over the statue and in the book, it bites him, yes. This is, of course, based off a true story? What are your opinions on that, J.D.? Who knows? Uh, I find it hard to believe that a horror movie is based off a true story, though. Well, the backstory behind this is that I believe the guy's name is uh, something DeFalco. It's like Tom DeFalco. He murdered his family, killed his whole family with a shotgun. The true story is that him and his lawyer and his defense team came up with this theory that there was a demon living in the basement of the house that was telling him to murder his family. And then, around the same time, this other family, the Lutzes, I believe were their name, moved into this house and then moved out a couple months later, claiming the house was haunted. That's pretty much the story, the real story. And then it was written into this very popular, successful book, which spawned this very popular, successful movie, which has spawned ten sequels. Is there really ten sequels? <laughs> yes, if you count the remix. How many remakes are there? There was the remake from a couple years ago with Ryan Reynolds, and there is two separate new Amityville films in production right now, both of which have been described as remakes. One is a 3D film, and one is a found footage film, so they're cashing in on both of the lame horror fads right now. <laughs> uh, found footage might be an interesting take on Amityville. It would be a lot like Paranormal Activity. <laughs> Still, it might be an interesting take. Anyway, this movie from 1979, it honestly, it's kind of a prestige film, which is sort of impressive when you realize how trashy it is. There's I a, like this movie. You like this movie? I do. Okay, because I watched the film and I found it to be incredibly campy. Well, it's campy, but it's got atmosphere. I haven't seen it in a while, but I remember just laughing throughout the whole thing. There's a vomiting nun early in the film, a nun vomit. Oh, and I guess the statue of Mary getting defiled in The Exorcist, that was that, that was scary. That was effective. It stars James Brolin, Josh's dad, and Margot Kidder, and Rod Steger plays the priest who goes blind in a very funny scene. Not funny, the fly is killing. <laughs> I'm not kill him, but... The suggestion in this film is that the spirits are driving the husband crazy. He expressed this anger and growing insanity by chopping lots and lots of wood. Is that what they called it back then? <laughs> <laughs> now, the movie does have a couple of cool things in it. Everybody knows the bleeding walls. The bleeding walls are very famous. In fact, there's a lot of blood showing up in places where blood doesn't belong in this film. The walls bleed, blood comes up through the sink and up through the toilet. Yeah, and there's that cool ectoplasm scene where they dig the... There's the room in the basement. What's the name? The imaginary best friend that shows up. Is it like Joni? Joni. In the book it was described as like a pig. And in the movie I think you just see a giant pair of eyes at one point. In the movie, mm -hmm. they describe her as a girl. Okay. It's yeah. like the okay. little sister of... The Annieville house itself is cool. In fact, it looks like a face itself with the way the windows and the chimney are placed. Mm -hmm. I guess it's kind of an urban legend when you think about it since there are people living in the real house now. They've remodeled it so it doesn't look exactly the same. In fact, they've remodeled it so people would stop going up knocking on their door and asking to see, you know, the demon in the basement or whatever. I love my dog. God knows my dog is spoiled. But if the house is bleeding, the floors are crumbling, no, sorry. Sorry, Poochie. You're screwed. I'm not going in for you. <laughs> Not even I'll shut up your kids. We can get another one. We'll get a better one, kids. <laughs> <laughs> so you name the dog, we'll get it. I don't care if it costs me my whole life savings. As long as we get to move out of the evil house. So you're a fan of this original, and I think it's pretty goofy. Have you seen any of the sequels? I think I've seen the second one. If I remember correctly, there's a lot of weird incest going on in part two. It's not really incest, because they're only stepbrother and sister. Okay. The demon is speaking for him through his headphones or something? I seem to remember that. Well, yeah, like, there's that, and then he ends up getting turned or possessed by the demon. And then it becomes an exorcist ripoff in the last act. No. Doesn't the priest go into the attic and try to exorcise him, and then the priest gets possessed? That's your stinger at the end of the credits? No. Really? Have you seen this movie? I thought I saw Annieville 2, The Possession, but I guess I haven't. Because <laughs> yeah, I'm... he ends up in jail at the end of it after he kills his family with the shotgun. It's more like a prequel. Uh, yeah, it is a prequel. I remember the scene where and he kills the family with the shotgun. The priest tries to exercise him in the jail, but okay. he never gets turned into the demon or okay, possessed I, by the demon. I saw it on TV, so maybe the TV edit's different. But I do remember the sequence where he kills the family as being pretty effective, and there are people who say this film is superior to the first one. I remember it being just as campy as the first one. Yeah, but there's certain parts of it that are a little bit creepier than the original. When he's down in the basement and all these dead things are rising up. I think I remember this. All you see is their shadows and their eyes glowing, and it's kind of creepy. So remember lots of deep demon voices, which are never scary. Well, no, they're never scary. Have but. you seen uh, Amityville 3D, the first one? I've seen a couple of sequels. I don't know which ones they well, are. Well, I, I, I remember <laughs> seeing Amityville 3D. You which know, one's the one where they make the Ouija board out of the paper and the glass? Is 
that? I don't know. I've seen the first three. And like a demon comes up out of the fucking floor or I something? I think that's the third one. There's a, definitely a demon coming out of the house in the third one. Okay. And there's a scene where the guy's in the bathroom and the walls close in. A woman is driving and there's a fly in the car making her crazy and she drives her car into a truck that's carrying a bunch of piping on the back and the pipe comes through. And after that, I haven't seen, because I know there's Amityville 4, which is in a different house because I think the house gets blown up at the end of part 3. And I believe part 4 was a TV movie. And there's the Amityville Curse and there's Amityville 1999 It's About Time, which is about a haunted clock from the original movie. That's right, because Part four is the one with the haunted lamp. A lamp from the original Amityville house is in this new house. And the lamp is evil. It's a ghost lamp. <laughs> oh my god, can we go on to the next movie, please? And there's Amityville Dollhouse, which is about a, a dollhouse that looks like the Amityville horror that causes freaky stuff. There's one with a mirror from the original house that causes the hauntings to continue. And like I said, there was the remake from a few years ago, which I saw and did not like the least bit. I thought it was pretty bad. With mm. Ryan Reynolds, I wasn't really... It definitely wasn't as good as the first one. Yeah, and then like I said, there's Amityville 3D, which is actually a remake. Somebody somehow got the rights to the fourth film in the series, and now they're doing this. And then there's the Amityville Tapes, I believe it's called, which has been in development with the Weinsteins for a couple Those of years. company was... Pretty much, but they still have some films in turnaround. Dance Macabre, Stephen King's examination of the horror genre. He talks about why the Amityville horror resonated with the public, even though all the critics hated it. It was a huge hit, obviously. Stephen King says he thinks it's because lots of people can relate to buying a new house that turns out to be a money pit. And it's not necessarily evil, but it does drain you in other ways. You think he might be onto something in that one? Yeah, but he's wrong about Batman. <laughs> The next film on my list is 1981's Ghost Story. Have you seen this one? I don't think so. Okay. Well, it's based off a critically acclaimed book by Peter Straub. The film basically... I already don't like it. Next. (laughs) It's about these group of people that come together, these old men, that come together called the Chowder Society, and they tell scary stories to each other. When they were young men back in the 20s, they all met this incredible radiant woman, and they were in love with her. But some things happen. She accidentally dies. They think she's dead, and they put her in the back of seat of a car, and they're pushing the car into the lake, and we all know what happens next. A hand pushes up against the glass and she's alive, oh no! And now, basically, 50, 60 years later, she's returned for vengeance. Dun, dun, dun! Now, I have a personal story about this movie. I had not seen it, and my mother was telling me all about it, and she was telling me that what a wonderful film it was. And I'm thinking, that movie sounds pretty awesome. I was probably 10. Eventually, years later, I got a chance to see it when Netflix came along, and I was extremely disappointed. The thing the film has going for it is its cast, and it's full of these old actors from the golden age of Hollywood from the 30s and 40s. Fred Astaire, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., Melvin Douglas, and they're all wonderful. But the movie really doesn't work as a horror film. None of the sequences that are supposed to be scary are really effective. And there's a lot of nudity in this film, and I don't just mean from the women. Oh. The film pretty much begins with a scene of a guy stark naked falling out of a window of a skyscraper, and you see it dangling in the wind, and it's a little weird. I think you're homophobes. <laughs> it's an odd way to start a film. It's not something you expect to see. <laughs> Alice Krieg, who was also in Sleepwalkers and played the Borg Queen on Star Trek many years later, so she sort of specializes in playing evil but sexy women, if you haven't noticed that. I don't know if she's really sexy. Let's kill somebody with a corn cob there. That's pretty cool. <laughs> So she is a good performance as the ghost woman. And there's a strange subplot about a homeless man who has a little kid who lives with him, and the little kid makes demon animal noises. And that's never explained. Maybe they explain that in the book. Supposedly the book is great. I've only seen the movie, and I was pretty whelmed by it. As we've seen through this list, there were... There's a ghost movie every couple of years in the 60s and 70s. And then in the early 80s, we got another big ghost movie that made the haunted house premise fashionable and interesting again for a new generation. And I'm talking, of course, about Poltergeist. Which is awesome! Expound on that. A little girl gets sucked into the ghost realm, and all holy hell breaks loose after that. Yes, Carol Ann. Carol Ann! Don't go into the light, Carol Ann. Zelda room and see, she just passed away about a year ago. Aww. The little weird midget woman from Poltergeist. I liked her. That she, saddens my heart. Yes, I liked Zelda Rubenstein as well. Plus, she was named Zelda. You know what Poltergeist is really about, though? Pot? Oh, <laughs> there's some pot in the movie, yeah. If you smoke pot, you're gonna tear your face off. That's what it's about. But it's also about the suburban dream going bad. That's really what it is about. This family, which features the guy from Coach. <laughs> well, before you go further, you bring up that whole ripping your face off thing. I just recently saw that movie not on TV. I've on never it. seen it uncut. So you just saw the face ripping so, scene for like, the first time. about four months ago or whatever when I was watching this movie, this guy just started ripping his face off and I was like, what the fuck? What's going on? I don't remember this in this movie. <laughs> Pretty graphic for it's a actually, PG rating, you know? <laughs> 
It's a lot scarier than I remember it being. And that scene is infamous for traumatizing young girls at sleepovers for years to come. What Poltergeist is really about is the suburban dream going bad because his family moves into this new house. They've got a, a new car and especially the TV. The TV is an important part of this film. And then what happens? It all goes evil. Their TV betrays them. Their fancy cuts of steak betray them. Their, their chairs betray them. <laughs> The only thing that can bring them together after the niceties of suburbia have betrayed them? Love, J.D. It's all about love. Only love can save you from the evil. <laughs> all we need is love. Of course, this film was directed by Toby Hooper of Texas Chainsaw Massacre fame. However, it was produced by Steven Spielberg, and there is an ongoing debate about how much of the movie was actually directed by Toby Hooper and how much was actually directed by Steven Spielberg. I'd say 90% of it was directed by Steven Spielberg. Honestly, I feel like there was an even split, because the early scenes in the movie of something like they'll turn their back and the chairs have been stacked, that very whimsical score... La, da, da, da. That feels very Spielbergian. In fact, it almost kind of feels like E.T. in spots. But at the end of the movie, when people start ripping their faces off and giant ghost beasts start appearing in walls and an evil clown pulls you under the bed and a mouth appears in the closet and tries to eat your face, that stuff feels very much like a Toby Hooper movie. In the pool with the skeletons, that stuff feels 100% Toby Hooper to me. Yeah, like all the light flares and stuff. That is Spielbergian. No doubt Spielberg was heavily present on set and it would not surprise me to find out that he directed some actual scenes. I know Zelda Rubenstein on her deathbed claimed that Steven Spielberg directed the whole movie and that Toby Hooper was high out of his brain the entire time, but other people claim otherwise. I mean, it's a good film. I think its reputation as one of the scariest movies ever made is a little overinflated. I mean, it's a special effects film, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but sometimes I feel like the special effects overwhelm the human center of the story, but I do like the movie. And the special effects do hold up. Oh yeah, yeah, it's all practical stuff, and it does look great. There's still some freaky shit in this movie, no doubt. I've always fought the clown in particular. Everybody remembers that clown. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but I think now it's more so because of scary movie too. How many times is that fucking movie going to come up in this episode? <laughs> hey, hey, you ready want to play play? Jesus. People claim this film is cursed. Do you believe that, JD? What do you mean by cursed? People think there's a curse following the actors because, of course, the little girl that played Carol Ann died, died very young. the making of the third one. Yes, girl who plays the teenage daughter in this film was murdered by her boyfriend months after it came out. Which is why she's not in the second one. <laughs> I can't remember the name of the actress that played the mother, but she claimed to have some poltergeist activity. You know, pictures on her walls were falling down and things like that. And, and the a... guy who was in coach isn't dead, but his career is. Yes. <laughs> Supposedly, the rumor behind this curse is that it's because they used real skeletons in the pool scene. I don't know they didn't. The story is that they would go to India and buy a bunch of real skeletons because the real skeletons are cheaper than the fake ones. Now, that would be ironic since this is a movie about somebody building a housing development over a bunch of graves and that coming I back to... I don't think they... It would be kind of ironic if they, they the people who made the movie made the same mistake. I don't know if I believe it's a really haunted film. However, it was a hugely successful film. It was one of the highest grossing films of 1982. Obviously, the, what happened next were sequels. Sam, what are your opinions on the sequels, J.D.? I didn't really like 2. It was a little bit weird. But 3 was actually pretty decent. I liked 3 a lot. That's not the first time I've encountered that opinion, and I'm the exact opposite. I think the second movie is pretty good. I like the way that it explains the haunting behind the first movie, and I especially like the way that it creates a central centralized figure, Reverend Kane. Yeah, those are cool parts of the thing. Because I mean, that guy is creepy. That guy is creepy as hell. <laughs> That's how he really looks. And that's another part of the curse. That guy died shortly after the film was finished. Though the fact that he was like 90 might have had something to do with it. And the guy who played the Indian chief in this movie, the actor who was also in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Orca, instead of getting Zelda back, they brought in this Indian dude who's kind of become... Zelda was in it too. No, she's in the third one. She's not in part two. Unless it was archive no. footage from the first movie. No. No, she's... I, I definitely do not remember her being in this film. I remember her being there. Look it up. You got a computer right here in front of you. Look it up. <laughs> I guarantee you she was there. It's Chief Wiggum, and it's the dad, and I think the mom was there. Craig T. Nelson is the dude from Coach, and Joe Beth Williams was the mom. And Heather O'Rourke was the little girl. Oh, Zelba was in it. Okay, well, her part's small compared to the first one. And Will Sampson is the Indian actor. Jesus. And Taylor's his name. Yeah, and of course, Julian Beck was the guy who played, yeah, Julian Beck. That was the name of the actor who played Kane, and he... And that's how he really looks. Yeah, he was a, he's a spooky-looking dude. And there's that wonderful scene where he's tapping on the screen door saying, you're 
all going to die in there. You know, the previous part of that movie for me with him in it is where he's just walking down the sidewalk oh, yeah, whistling. That, that's a great scene, too. That creeped me out. I'm like, holy shit, this guy's up to no fucking Because he, it's kind of the same effect that the tall man in Phantasm has. Weird old dudes in suits are creepy. And, of course, there's a lot of weird body horror stuff in this. There's the famous scene where Craig T. Nelson, instead of smoking pot, like in the first movie, they drink a thing of tequila, and he swallows the worm. You never <laughs> swallow the worm. Especially when it grows and you end up vomiting out a giant hell beast. The subtitle for this movie is The Other Side. And that's an important notice because in the first movie, they draw Carol Ann back from the other side. In this movie, the whole family goes to the other side to rescue her. And also, Cain sings something about from the other side. Oh yeah, there's some Bible hymns that have been repurposed for sinister effect. And when they go to the other side, Cain and all his followers have been absorbed together into some horrible monster thing. You ever seen Human Centipede? (laughs) And H.R. Giger, who did the alien, and Alien uh, designed the monsters for this film. Is that why it looks like a penis? Yes. (laughs) Horribly AIDS-ridden penis? Yes. There's nothing creepier than a rotting dick. It hits close to home, literally. I think he knows that. That's probably why he did it. I enjoy Poltergeist, too. And honestly, you say you didn't like it, but it sounds like you enjoyed it, too. No, I mean, I liked it. I feel like I liked the third one better. Really? Because I feel like the third one is compromised in a lot of ways. Because first off, the only returning cast members are Heather O'Rourke and Zelda Rubinson, and Zelda's part is kind of small. She doesn't make it out of this movie. Spoiler alert. Yeah, she dies. And of course Kane is in it, but Julian Beck had already passed, so they have a different actor playing him, and he's under very heavy makeup, and frankly it looks pretty bad in my opinion. It looks like he's wearing a cheap Halloween mask. I've seen Poltergeist 3. I don't remember being all that impressed with it. But I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff in that one, though. Like, okay, tell me, because I don't remember it. When Carol Ann's looking in the mirror, and the evil Carol Ann is there, okay. and they get like this old woman to play the evil evil Carol Ann, and eventually Carol Ann ends up getting snatched into the mirror. By again, her. she's pulled into the other side again. Yes. Poor, poor girl. She should just stay in a padded room. <laughs> There's no mirrors, no, no television, TVs, nothing with a reflective surface. No fire. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. It's pretty cool because the cousin and her boyfriend go or go chasing after her. Well, this is the evil Carol Ann anyway. Mm-hmm. Go chasing after her into the car garage and gets sucked into a puddle of water. Oh yeah, I remember the puddle of water, yes. Basically, the whole cast died in this movie with the exception of Nancy Allen. Yes, and why this film doesn't bring back many characters from the previous two, it does have a good cast. Tom Skerritt, Nancy Allen, a young Laura Flynn Boyle. I forgot she was in this. I feel like this movie does a pretty good job of making you care about the new characters as much as you cared about the old ones. I feel the whole sub-story of this is that the aunt's pushing everybody away. She's got some kind of mental disorder going on where she pushes everybody away. Okay. Or not a mental disorder, but a psychosis, if you will. But that ends up coming into a crucial part at the end of the story because how she has to save her family is that she has to take them into their heart. I agree. take them into her yeah, heart again, or whatever. You know, that's a recurring film in these films. The family love is the only thing that yeah. can protect you. It's a pretty cool movie. It does a lot of cool stuff. It tries to creep you out more than it tries to, like, scare you like the other two did. And I think that's why I like it as much as I do because they try to do something different okay. than well, the other two. Because the other two are kind of, like, jump right out in your face and scare the shit out of you. And this one here is kind of, like, keep you on the edge of your seat. Poor low key. Yeah. It does stuff. They're looking into this water and then all of a sudden they just get sucked in. Mm-hmm. I mean, it does have a couple of jump scares, but, I mean, for the most part, it's pretty low-key and kind of just keeps you on the edge of your seat wondering what's going to happen next. Yeah, this film kind of bombed when it came out, and... But, I mean, it was the third movie. Third films very rarely. <laughs> Obviously ended the franchise, and even if it hadn't, Heather R. Works death would have. But the movie has developed its defenders in the past couple of years. That's not the first time I've heard somebody say they prefer three to two. And this movie was directed by Gary Sherman, who made a favorite of mine, the zombie movie Dead and Buried. Have you watched Dead and Buried yet? I told you to. I haven't, no. You should see it. It's really good. He also did a movie called Death Line, Lisa, he's well, a good... One more one more thing about okay. this movie, sorry. Okay. Another thing that they try to do that I think is pretty cool is they try to blame the whole thing on Carol Ann being crazy. Yes. Like she was imagining the whole thing. And so, I, I kind of like that aspect of it too, like trying to make her doubt herself into did this stuff actually happen. And something like their parents couldn't handle Carol Ann anymore and they yeah, took her off to the end. That's something I remember kind of sticking in my teeth, the fact that after all they had been through over the last two movies that they just sort of get rid of her this time, it seems kind of unfair to her. It's like, Jesus. Well, yeah. So much for family love. Love. Um. <laughs> well, they're like, damn it, we just went through this shit twice. You're, you're going to your aunt's house. 
I actually think the parents like end up dying or something. Don't uh, no, I, I remember her parents being alive. They just she was living with the aunt and uncle for some reason. I don't remember why. I think it had something to do if she was like receiving special psychiatric treatment in Chicago. And we forgot to mention one of the best scenes about the first movie. What's the best scene from the first movie we didn't mention? At the end, when they're in the hotel and the dad pushes the TV Oh, yeah, out. And, and that I feel that further reinforces the subtext about, let's, hey, get rid of the TV and spend some time with your fam. Now, they're remaking the original Poltergeist. Did you know this? No, I did not. Yes. I don't like it. Well, a remake's been kicking around for a while, and it's finally found the home at Ghost House, which is Sam Raimi's production company. Oh, God. And he's going to produce the film, and he says he's going to have a very hands-on... He's not directing, but he wants a very hands-on presence in remaking Poltergeist. Don't know if there's going to be a lot of slapstick. Maybe that might work in Literally the film's favor. It might work in the film's favor, though. I don't know. I've liked most of Sam Raimi's films. Yeah, but the movies he produces are things like The Grudge, films that we tend to not like so much. So obviously, ghosts were on people's minds in the early 80s. <laughs> Who are you going to call? That's right. 1980, now Ghostbusters. Is Ghostbusters a horror movie? No, I don't think so. I mean, it has some horror aspects. But well, it definitely has horror elements, but it plays them mostly for comedy. Yeah, this movie made me fall in love with Bill Murray. Oh, he's so great in this film. And, you know, Bill Murray is hilarious. He's the MVP on this. And the Seymour guy. What's his name? I can't uh, C- draw a blank. Rick Moranis. Yeah, Rick Moranis. The Seymour guy. <laughs> Feed me, Seymour. But honestly, my favorite Ghostbuster, it's not Venkman. It's not... It's the black guy, isn't it? I, I do love me some Ernie Hudson, but actually my favorite has always been Egon for some reason. Egon's always been my favorite Ghostbuster ever since I was a little kid. Mine's Venkman. You know, I like Venkman, and I think Dan Aykroyd is very underrated in this film. He is so funny. I thought of some Something, something that could never hurt me. The Stay Puff Marshmallow Man? Yeah. I mean, everybody knows Stay Puff, and it's just one of those amazing visual gags. Usually, big budget special effect comedies do not work, but this film, it just has a really hilarious screenplay. Funny yeah, and movie. I think the cast really makes it oh, work, yeah. too. Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray and Harold Ramis, they were all friends. And you just feel that in the film. There's such a back and forth between them that really works. You say it isn't a horror movie, and I say it really isn't a horror movie either, but I say that as somebody who was scared shitless by Zool when I saw it as a kid. <laughs> Any scenes where Sigourney Weaver finds something weird happening in her apartment. I like that. I feel like that's comical. Oh, I like it too. I mean, like, what, what the hell would you do if you opened the fridge and, and there was a, a demon people? dog in your fridge? Or the scene where the eggs are cooking on the... But the scene that really got me when I watched this movie as a kid where the hand's coming out of the cleaner. That is kind of creepy. Yeah. I'll admit that. Kind mm. of body horror too. It plays on it a little bit. Once Diana is possessed, that's when the movie really kicks into hilarity for me. The scene where Venkman goes to see her and she's like, I want you inside me. And he's like, oh, it sounds a little crowded in there already. Rick Moranis is hilarious in this movie. How he's constantly trying to hit on women that are way out of his league by throwing these really awkward parties in his apartment. And he opens up the closet and throws a coat on the demon dog's head. Of course, the monster designs in this film are classic. The demon dogs are great. The Slimer, who's actually not called Slimer in any of the movies. They call him Spud. I like Slimer better. And it's sort of weird that Slimer will become the mascot, where in this movie, he's not evil, but he's definitely not working with the Ghostbusters. And that whole sequence where they destroy the dining room in the fancy okay, hotel. Okay, well, this movie was made in a time where Scooby-Doo was really popular but coming to a... Like, well, we gotta get another kind of Scooby gang. The sequence where he steps out of the dining room with the smoking trap. We came, we saw, we kicked its ass! <laughs> <laughs> You know, we I also like the part where he dances on those steps. I mean, I don't know why, but I find that kind of And cool. there are a lot of pretty hilarious... The the ghost blowjob? I don't remember that. The one. scene where Dan Aykroyd's laying in bed and there's a ghost woman above him and then his pants come undone and you see his face go, ooh. As a kid, oh, yeah. that always went over my head as a kid. I never never understood that scene as a child. Rewatching it as an adult, it's like, I can't believe my parents let me watch this movie. <laughs> We didn't grow up in the 80s, but we love a lot of... All those 80s movies were on TV, though, as kids, and we had them all on VHS, so Ghostbusters was a big part of my childhood. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Oh, I love Ghostbusters. And the cartoon had a lot, which was on when I was a kid. It yeah. had a lot to do with it. And again, that's when the Scooby gang was starting to die off as a popularity. Yeah, the yeah. USA cartoon afternoon, it was Scooby-Doo and Ghostbusters back-to-back. I remember that. So yeah, Ghostbusters, I don't think anybody's going to argue that this movie is a classic. And if they do, you know, I don't want to talk to you. Screw off. Now, what are your opinions on Ghostbusters 2 from 1980? I wouldn't say it's as good as the original. It's close, though. It's still pretty good. It's just... I like Ghostbusters 2 a lot, for the most part. The 
first one, though, just has so many crazy scenes that are hard to top. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that Ghostbusters 2 is not as funny as the first film. However, there's some pretty memorable... I think the whole concept of the River of Slime underneath of New York is... I don't know if it's creepy, but it's certainly memorable. River of Slime underneath New York? Didn't think that was scary? Kind of comical? I don't think it was scary, but it was weird. As a, especially the scene where the slime comes through the bathtub and is going after Oscar, the baby. There's still some spooky stuff. The scene of the slime in the bathtub spooked me, but not as bad as the scene where Janos... Janos comes through the window and grabs the kid. That freaked me out. As that was freaky. No, Janos was the name of the bad no, guy. Yeah, Janos was the guy, the nerd, and Vigo was the painting. Vigo, the Carpathian. Oh yeah. Who, of course, was voiced by the great Max von Chado of Exorcist and Flash Gordon fame and many other wonderful films. Just voice, not play. Janos. I'm not a big fan of the plot line where the Ghostbusters are destitute and washed up. I find it hard to believe that anybody would accuse them of hoaxing New York. How the hell are you going to hoax a 30-story marshmallow man going downtown? I don't really know how they thought that was fake. Kind of like the idea that they worked themselves out of a job. Well, that makes sense. They were so prolific in the first movie. There's so many ghosts to catch, you know? You have to run out of ghosts eventually. Well, people are dying every day, though. Not um, New York. Well, more so in New York. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, uh, but there are... But with your river of slime thing, mm -hmm. I think that's kind of a prelude to what the city is nowadays. Because, yeah. <laughs> you know, it made people angry. Yeah, that was that's an interesting about the slime is it's reactive to emotions. I love the scene where they make the toaster dance. At the end, with the Statue of Liberty. Honestly, how do you top State Puff Marshmallow Man? You top it by turning the Statue of Liberty into a walking monolith that smashes things with her torch. I think that's pretty cool to me. Where they come down into the museum and Janos is going on and Bill Murray's like, all right, slime this guy. Which Janos is played by the, oh, yeah, that the Renfield guy. Yes, from Dead and Loving It. From Dead and Loving yeah. It. Yeah. He also played the camp counselor in Adam's Adam, Family Value. He Values. was in Adam's Family Value. You just rewatched that on Netflix Instant. Yes, I did. I actually like that one a little bit better. Both of those are hilarious. I love those Yeah, movies. but I think, I think the first one's a little bit more gothic. That's fair to say. I mean, I know it has its comical moments, but I like to think that that was a little bit more serious than the second one. Mm. I laughed so hard at the second one. I love both of those Adam Sandler movies. When they get Wednesday to smile, and that girl's going, it's, Baker, stop Yeah, no, <laughs> it's, it's creepy. Back to topic, sorry. Yeah, way, way off topic. We need to talk about those. We need to do a horror comedy episode or something. We need to find a reason to I talk about I think we could do a whole Adam Sandler thing, honestly. Well, I mean, there have been a couple of different things. Anyway, way, whoa, way off topic. Ghostbusters 2, it's not as good as the first one, but I feel like it's a worthy sequel. I like this film a lot. Vigo is a great villain. I think this one to me, like Adam's Family One, is more serious than. You think Part Two is more serious? Than I, the first I would one? think so. I mean, like, really? I suppose so. Because I mean, it tries to play more on the horror aspect as opposed to the comedy aspect of the first one, and maybe that's why we don't like it as much. I feel like it's pretty even, though. I feel like this maintains that same balance from the first movie. It doesn't have as much a memorable dialogue, and the whole thing about a Vinkman and Diana being together as a couple and having a kid—I don't know—that that sort of sticks in my teeth. I also don't like that they paired up Janine with Scully or whatever Rick Moranis, because obviously her and Egon were meant to get together. I don't know. I think that's kind of cute that Rick Moranis gets a girlfriend. Though Annie. Potts is smoking in this movie. So Does, hot. Doesn't he, like, get possessed again in this movie? No. Puts on the Ghostbuster costume and goes to get on a bus and there's Slimer driving the bus for some reason. And he oh. thinks he saves the day when the dome of slime come off of the museum. He thinks it was him that did it. Oh, yeah, that's right. I feel Ghostbusters 2 is a worthy sequel. Some people really dislike it, but... I don't dislike it. I mean, I like it. I just, like I said, I think this one plays a little bit more on the horror aspect than the Absolutely. comedy. And like you said, it doesn't have as much memorable dialogue. Yeah, that's definitely true. Now, what do you think about the prospects of Ghostbusters 3 ever happening. It needs to fucking happen. Bill Murray, get off your stupid fucking couch, get your head out of your ass, and make this movie. It's been kind of confirmed that Bill Murray is one of the one holding out on Ghostbusters 3, but I don't know. I don't know if we need it. At this point, everybody involved is so old and fat. But see, they could play on that so well. They could, but I don't want the original team sidetracked in favor of a young team, which has been the plan all along. I don't feel like they, they would have to sidetrack it. You know, this could be their last hurrah. Bill Murray is still around, but he sort of reinvented himself, not as a serious actor, but as he's always been kind of roguish. The whole thing of Bill Murray is he doesn't have an agent that talks to producers and stuff. He has an answering machine, and you call that number, and if he's interested in your project, he'll call you back. I'm not going to besmirch Bill Murray for doing this thing. Of course, he was just on Letterman a couple nights ago and said that he still kind of wants to do Ghostbusters 3 because he wants to hang out with everybody again. Who knows? I would be very surprised if it ever happens. At this point. Well, it needs to, and I and I think the perfect plot for it is they decide that they're getting too old to do it. They're getting too old for this shit. <laughs> yeah, they're getting too old for this shit. And the whole cast is still alive. They need oh, yeah. they need to make this happen before 
of one of them dies. It's sort of amazing that Ernie Hudson is the best looking guy from that first movie. <laughs> they they could play it off as they're feeling like they're getting too old, and they could have they could be training the new guys, and the new guys get captured by the new big bad, if you will. Mm-hmm. And their last hurrah is to rush in and save the new kids. Like they don't even have to really have the new kids in it. They could just it could just be a whole long training montage, if you will. <laughs> Of the new guys. I mean, and Ghostbusters is still very present in our pop culture sphere. And the cartoon was on for many years after the movies were over. And there was that video game a couple years ago that was fairly well received. There's still Ghostbusters merchandise being made and sold. So I don't and know. they're always re-releasing special editions of yeah. the movies. I would go see it if it came out. I mean, of course I would go see it. But I don't know. I wonder if it could be good at this point. But like I said, I think that would be the perfect plot. And then, with that being their last raw, they could have it opened up for... Possibly more, and I think that is definitely the plan. And they always need more movies. Moving on from Ghostbusters. Now, you haven't seen either version of The Woman in Black, have you? No. Okay, well, I won't talk about these too long. But The Woman in Black, at first it was a critically acclaimed book. And then it was a critically acclaimed stage play, which is still performed all over the country. In 1989, the BBC turned it into a TV movie. And there are people out there who say this TV movie, The Woman in Black, is the scariest film they've ever seen but not me it's really british uh, it is so droll and so dry and so boring and there are scenes that could potentially so british and so british there are scenes that could be potentially spooky do you even know what the movie's about ghosts well i mean this guy Daniel radcliffe getting haunted by ghosts and well he dying this guy i don't want to spoil anything but this guy he goes away from his family to this distant island and the whole point with this island is that during low tide, you can get through. But during high tide, the land bridge is submerged, and you're stuck on this house on this island. And there was this old woman that lived there, and her spirit is still there and still haunts the place. There are people who love that original movie, and one of the things about it that's appealing, I think, is it's hard to find. It was released on DVD once, like, ten years ago, and that DVD is way out of print now and goes for hundreds of dollars on eBay. I saw it on YouTube, and it wouldn't surprise me if it's on there somewhere. I don't know if it's still there or not. Yeah, they recently remade it. The remake just came out this year, starring Daniel Radcliffe's post Harry Potter coming out party. <laughs> it's the newest production from the New Hammer. I've been mostly pleased with a lot of the stuff the New Hammer has done, and it definitely has that hammer feel to it, has that atmosphere and that period style, but the movie relies way too much on jump scares. There's like a jump scare every 15 minutes in this thing. It got old before it was over. But Daniel Radcliffe... See, our problem is, is we've seen so many. We... You know, the films don't make it hard to predict when a jump scare is coming. It's... What pisses me off is when they set you up for a jump scare, and, and you're all prepared, and then they close the door, and there's nothing there. Or, in this film, there's a scene where there's weird noise this building, we don't know what's going on, and then really loud, but it's the plumbing. One of the pipes explode, and this disgusting brown water comes out of the sink. There are a couple of fake outs, and the fake out jump scares are even worse than the regular jump scares. It's like, movie, why are you wasting my time? I mean, it was cool when they first started doing that. Kind of interesting because I got tired of every time that they close a mirror, they close a mirror, there's going to be something there. <laughs> close the mirror, wipe off the steam, and there's nothing there. <laughs> it's like, why did you? Do that, you stupid fucking movie! By the mid-90s, horror was in an interesting place. Scream came out and made the slasher movie subgenre hot again. You had the Blair Witch Project popularizing the found footage genre. And then another movie that was hugely influential and successful was, of course, The Sixth Sense from 1999. This was on everybody's radar that year. Pretty good movie. It is a pretty good movie, but what... It's one of the two good M. Night Shyamalan movies. I think there are at least three good M. Night Shyamalan movies. If you say The Village, I swear to God, I'll No, 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 I, I like Unbreakable a lot. And oh, I, I forgot about Unbreakable. Okay. okay, I'll give you three. Yeah, those first three films of his are pretty good. I didn't see The Sixth Sense when it first came out. I didn't see it until years after the fact, until all the hype had died down, which is really the best way to see a movie like this. I mean, it's a horror movie, but it's not really... The film is more... It's a ghost detective. <laughs> The film is a coming-of-age story, really, is what it is. And it's kind of a sad movie, because it's about this sad little kid who doesn't have any friends and can't relate to anybody. So he starts talking to ghosts. Yeah. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Tony Collette, I believe it's Tony Collette as the mom, gives a very good performance. And Haley Joel Osment, it's a shame that his career sort of burnt what out. Yeah, what happened to him? I Not a whole lot. Has he been in the movie since AI? Probably, but his career really sort of dropped out when his balls dropped, you know? It's a shame, because he gives a good performance in this film. He's very good in this movie. He's pretty good. All the movies I've seen him in, for a child actor. Or anything. And the film does definitely have some creepy moments. The scene that always got me is when the woman with the cuts on her arms suddenly pops into the little boy's tent, that, or it's like chasing him down the hall. That that scene sort of spooked me. Or when you, or when that one kid from the seventies turns around and he sees a big ass hole in the back. Of his yes. Head. The one part that got me and got me so fucking good, and I'll admit <laughs> it, is when he reaches underneath that bed. Fucking hand comes out and grabs him. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> What the hell? 
I love the sequence, and it's not a frightening sequence, but it's a scene where him and his mom are in the car during a traffic jam, and you see the bicyclist by the window. That's the scene where the mother first starts to believe that he really can see dead people. What do you think of Willis in this movie? He has a very interesting role, because can't he see them too? The movie, of course, begins with him being assaulted, and his, he's a shrink. He goes home, catches his wife cheating, and then he gets shot, right? No, his, his wife isn't cheating on him. There with his wife and one of his patients breaks into the house and shoots him. Oh, okay. My bad. My played bad. by a skeletal-looking Danny Wahlberg. And then, of course, throughout the film, you know, his wife is very cold to him, and he doesn't understand why this romantic relationship with his wife is falling apart. It's almost as if she can't see him. Hmm. Spoiler alert. Bruce Willis is dead. But anyhow, isn't the whole, sh- isn't the whole shake it that he believes him because he sees the dead people too? I believe he, as a child, he also saw ghosts. Yes, something like that. It's been awesome since I've seen no, it I too. No, I mean like since he was dead, he could see the other ghosts. Perhaps. I'm not sure. It's been a while. It's a good film. And the reason it works as a film is because it's got a really good writing. I don't know what the hell happened to M. Night Shyamalan at one point. He did Six Sense, The Six Sense, Unbreakable Signs, all good films. And then... The Village. The Village, which wasn't all that good. And then Lady in the Water, which wasn't really that good. And then The Happening, which was a terrible piece of shit. And then The Last Airbender, which, which was, was just a, hot a, coals in my eyes. Which was a <laughs> piece of shit that a piece of shit ate in the shout out. <laughs> I don't know what happened to M. Night. What I think happened is that he got his own head up his ass because people were telling him that he's the next Alfred Hitchcock. He just lost the ability to write a good screenplay, which is weird because this movie in particular and his next two all have really strong screenplays. Lady in the Water just it looked so good. Well, there are a lot of problems with Lady in the Water. Let's not go into that. That movie has a mile-long list of issues. The Sixth what Sense... What was a lady in the water? I never even figured that she out. She was a narf. A narf? That's what she said. She called herself a narf, and that's one of the problems with the movies. All the fantasy creatures have really goofy names. I thought she was like the lady in the... Well, lady she's... The no, she's she's kind of a mermaid water nymph thing. It's not really Anyhow, explained well. But The Sixth Sense is good. That movie holds up. I will maintain that that is a very well-made film. And a film that came out two years after the fact that I feel probably got made because of The Sixth Sense is The Others from 2001. Now, what do you think about this one, J.D.? I like it. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a pretty interesting movie. It's full of atmosphere, if you will. Oh, my God. The atmosphere is amazing in this film. And this whole time, you're thinking that this family is being haunted by this... Oh, wait, wait, wait. Going back to The Sixth Sense for one minute. Did the twist ending surprise you when you first saw the movie? Or had it already been spoiled for you at that point? I saw it in theaters, I think. Okay. Yeah, because I was kind of little and I, start, you know, I okay. had to start really learning... The conventions of the genre, yeah. Yeah, yeah it kind of threw me for a little bit of a loop. I mean, I kind of suspected that he was dead, but... And it's really obvious once once the movie tells you that. That's why his wife isn't paying attention to him. But the thing that makes that twist more than just a twist is that it actually wraps up that character's emotional story arc. The reason he basically forgives his wife for the isolation, because it's not really her fault. So it's not just a twist ending. It's not just meant to surprise the audience and blow their mind like the twist in some of M. Night's later films are meant to be. The The Others is definitely the best of the post-Sixth Sense ghost stories, and there were a bunch of them. Even though the movie obviously happened because of that film and has some similarities this movie is a homage to old English ghost stories is influenced heavily by the innocence and the haunting and films like that there you can follow its DNA back to old English ghost stories and Nicole Kidman gives a wonderful performance in this film well she normally gives a good performance but she used to give really good performances now I don't know what's up with her but well now she's so rich she's got her head up her ass the thing that's interesting about this movie is like the innocence it puts you in the brain of of the leading lady. And that's actually what makes the film more intense as it goes on. For those who haven't seen it, the premise behind this film, it takes place uh, post-World War II, or is it World War I? I think it's World War I. It's post-war Britain. Mother is living with her two children in this fog-shrouded house out in the middle of nowhere, and her kids have this disease that make them sensitive to light. She's always waiting for the father to come back from the war. Basically, they believe that there's a haunting going on in this house. Now, there is a twist ending, and it's not too hard to figure out if you were paying attention in 2001. What makes the movie work puts you in the brain of Nicole Kidman's character, and you really become just as protective of her children as she is. So when things start to really go nuts in the last act, it builds to an incredible intensity, like The Innocents. If you like The Others, you'll like The Innocents, okay? So check that movie out. Anyway. I like The Innocents a lot. Or The Others. Or The Others. Whatever. The fucking movie we're talking about. (laughs) Crazy atmosphere. The atmosphere is amazing. There's so much fog. So much fog. So much fog. <laughs> fog is great! <laughs> I love fog! Oh my god, it's fog! Oh shit! The star of this movie is the fog. We forgot the fog. Oh shit, we did forget the fog. <laughs> the 
Frog is totally a ghost story. We'll talk about that when we do John Carpenter in October. Okay. Earlier we talked about the remake of House on Haunted Hill, which was done by a production company called Dark Castle, which was Robert Zemeckis's horror company. At least it used to be horror. Now they started making uh, action movies and stuff. The original shtick with Dark Castle is that they were going to remake all of William Castle's movies, which I think is maybe where the title came from, the title of the company. Oh, uh, maybe. So they did House on Haunted Hill, and then they did 13 Ghost. Now, you've never seen the original 13 Ghost. No, I have not. It's definitely one of William Castle's lesser films. It's pretty goofy stuff. And the whole gimmick behind that movie is that in order to see the ghost in the film, you have to put on a pair of special glasses, which they gave you when you bought your tickets, of course, because every William Castle movie had a gimmick. The gimmick in uh, House on Haunted Hill is that skeletons were dropped down from the roof into the theater during that movie. Did you really need the glasses to see the ghost? Like- yeah, you needed to put on these paper 3D glasses to see the ghost in the movie, which is something they reference in the remake, which was also in 2001. And the remake has one of the worst titles ever. You're thinking, what's wrong with 13 Ghosts as a title? Well, there's nothing wrong with that. It's the fact that they spell the word 13 with the numbers 1 and 3 in there. That's retarded. It was retarded when David Fincher did it in 7. It was retarded when they did it in this movie. Now, you have seen the remake. Yeah. I remember everybody talking about this movie in high school. It was a big release in high school for some reason. I don't know why. Because it was a PG-13 horror movie. It was not PG-13. This is definitely an R-rated movie. Really? Because I saw it by myself. Well, not by myself. Well, there's a, a, there's a lot of gore, and then the one ghost is a naked lady. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, she's nice to look at if you can ignore the scars and stuff. The scars didn't bother me. <laughs> There's no sexual depravity there. We're horror nerds, so fake blood, it turns us on. Anyway, the remake, as much as the original 13 Ghosts, which was made in 1960, and it feels very much like a post-50s gimmick kids matinee horror movie, the 2001 version of 13 Ghosts is just as much an artifact of its time. It's an alt-rock horror movie. It feels like a Linkin Park music video. The way it's shot and the way it's done just sort of, it feels like the kind of movies that were big at that period. Things like Fear.com. Although that was a stupid movie. Movie. Films like that, you know, there were hundreds of them. Exactly. Just completely disposable movies that were made when horror of this type was kind of popular for a brief period. There are some notable things. Ghosts are kind of cool. It's a ghost movie, but it's also a monster movie, really, the way the ghosts are treated. Pretty cool. I like that concept. If, you yeah, know. the makeup is pretty I mean, good. there's 12 ghost sacrifices, and then the 13th ghost is... I remember the story being kind of convoluted. It wasn't convoluted. You just had to pay attention. Yeah, well, the movie really isn't worth paying attention to. The whole glass house premise is kind of interesting. It, there is one great kill in this movie, and I think you know what I'm talking about. The one where the glass cuts the guy yes, in half? Yes, yeah. Sort of... Cuts him in half lengthwise. That's a pretty fun kill, but beyond that, I don't know if 13 Ghosts from 2001 has much value. I it's... like it. If you like ghost movies, check it out. Mm. It's worth a rental. I guess so. I guess it is worth a rental. If you have Netflix and you're paying for the monthly service, but... I'm sure you can find the DVD. And this Netflix. is the kind of movie that would be great to watch on Netflix instead. A pen and paper rental, but I can get it for free on the internet, go for it. But you probably can. In the new millennium, this interesting ghost has just continued. We've been seeing a lot of ghost movies over the last couple years. In 2007, there was 1408. Did you see that one? I saw it. I wasn't a big fan. I thought it was pretty decent. I'm a John Cusack fan, I think that's fair to say. And he gives a good performance in this movie. It's very much a special effects driven film, and I feel like at times you can tell this was a 10 page short story by Stephen King that they had to stretch into a feature length movie. But there are definitely some effective moments. Right around the time when the water and the sea painting starts coming into the room. Maybe it's gone too far, it's but... Jumped a shark. Yeah, there's a decent sense of dread building throughout this movie. Special effects don't all hold up, but I don't know. 1408. Not bad. Pretty good. However, in 2009, generally speaking, every year, sometimes, usually every year, you get one little horror movie that kind of comes out of nowhere and becomes something of a phenomenon. It happens every once in a while. Back in the early 2000s, it was Saw, little independent horror movie that not a lot of people knew about and came out and became this huge hit and spawned this long-running franchise. Paranormal Activity from 2009. I had heard nothing about this movie and suddenly it was coming out in a month and everybody was saying, oh my god, this movie is so scary, you will shit your pants. Your shit will shit its pants. It was a pretty scary fucking movie. I liked it. I liked Paranormal Activity. Don't get me wrong. It definitely isn't the scariest movie ever made and I feel like when it came out it was overhyped. I now know how the people who saw The Sixth Sense and The Blair Witch Project in the theaters felt. Oh yeah, it's a good movie but it doesn't live up to the hype. But let's talk about Paranormal Activity. This film has really caused a resurgence in the 
found footage concept. It wasn't a new concept. It had been done before. But even Blair Witch, which was a huge cultural phenomenon, did not spawn a lot of notable imitators. But this movie, Eternal Activity, has just busted the, the genre wide open. And I think that's because of things like YouTube. People have gotten used to watching home video footage. Yeah. Some people would say this movie doesn't even count as a ghost movie because it's not a ghost. It's a demonic entity. Does it take corporeal form? Sort of, a little bit, depending on which ending you saw. Okay, does it take corporeal form without possessing somebody? There are a lot of talk of demons in a lot of this movie. I feel like there's something of a crossover between the ghost concept and the demonic entity concept. My thing is, you don't see the damn thing the whole entire movie. Fine, it's a demonic spirit, but it's a fucking ghost. It's a spirit, people. (laughs) And what is a spirit? A ghost. My biggest problem with this movie is that the husband, the lead character, is an asshole. I like that about it. His girlfriend has been living with this evil entity hovering over her shoulders her entire life. She obviously tells that she's serious and upset about this. He makes fun of her. The psychic says, no, don't get a Ouija board. That'll piss him off. And what does the guy do? Goes to the store, buys a Ouija board. One point in the movie, don't they say, don't go in the attic? And then he goes in the attic. I really hate it in movies where that happens. And it happens a lot in the horror genre. And this film is a prime offender. Despite that, there were some legitimately clever elements. The sequences where they have the camera running while they're sleeping. And at first, nothing happens. And then something small will happen. Like the door will move just a little bit. And it escalates. And I thought that was actually kind of clever. That plays on a real life fear that I have. That I don't know what's happening around me when I'm sleeping. Spoken like a true... I can't even... What? What? Say it. Like a true homebody. Oh, okay. You don't worry about that, too? When worry. I'm asleep, I don't give a shit. If it's going to kill me, I'm going to be fucking asleep while I'm on it. I'm not even going to know. Didn't. I'll wake up in the light or the fire, whichever. <laughs> Ever since I was a little kid, I was afraid of somebody killing me in my sleep. But what's your thoughts on the first paranormal activity? I liked it. I liked it a lot. I, I found it kind of scary. It scared the shit out of me. I'm not even going to lie about it. It scared the shit out of me. It got to you. Yeah, it did. Have you seen any of the sequels? I've seen the second one. I haven't seen the third one yet. Yeah. I want to. But I'm no. in the same boat. I saw Paranormal Activity 2, and this is something <laughs> that started... They they did it in Saw, and now they're doing it in this series, where it's not really a sequel, because the events are going on at the same time as the first movie, and that kind of pisses me off. Don't call it Part 2, then. Call it Paranormal Activity Zero, or whatever. Paranormal Activity Negative One. Just don't Saul, call it... Saw is in numerical order. Well, no, because Saw 4 takes place at the same time as Part 3, and there's some more time-skipping. Oh, well, that doesn't count. The second half of the franchise. The second, the part of the franchise nobody likes. For a long time, you hadn't seen any of the Saw movies. Have you actually caught up I've now? seen, like, Saw 3, and maybe 5, and I think I've seen... I know I've watched Saw 2 all the way through. Okay. Have you seen the first one? No. Well, now that you've seen the, the sequel, you've, it's ruined the twist at the end of the first one. I don't give a shit. I enjoy the first three Saw movies. After that, I stopped giving a shit. When they killed off Jigsaw, it sort of lost its purpose. They have to have Saw in space. I will go see Saw in space. I've got that screenplay. The the puppet appears in the holograph and looks at them and says, I want to play a game. And then the do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do. And then the building in the train starts to rumble and they fly off into space. Anyway, Paranormal Activity 2, <laughs> it's the same sort of thing you find in a lot of sequels. It sort of ramps up the first movie. There's a lot more jump scares and noise happening. The thing with Paranormal Activity 2 is that it ends on a cliffhanger, which really sort of annoyed me. And apparently the third movie is a prequel, so it doesn't resolve the cliffhanger. Okay, so the way that it works, you have to watch them in the order of 3, 2, and 1. Kind of going backwards. Yeah. I, to me, it's kind of an interesting idea. People have always done sequels. Did see. your ass burgers kick in, <laughs> and you're thinking, okay, well, why? It annoys me because, especially when part 2 ends on a cliffhanger, and instead of resolving that they're going further back in time. They're dragging their feet. They're trying to stretch the story out more so they can make more movies. That annoys me. Fear of a Paranormal Activity 4 being made yet? No, it's coming out. It's oh, coming is out. it? Yeah, it's coming out in October. Oh my god, I gotta see the third one. <laughs> The third one actually got some pretty decent notices. Apparently there's a sequence involving an oscillating fan that's quite effective. Uh, I, I did do some interesting stuff with the office, Yeah, so. I'm, I'm a little worn out on found footage right now, though, to tell you the truth, but I don't know. I mean, Chronicle was pretty good. Yeah, but Chronicle wasn't a horror movie. Well, you did specify it had to be horror. <laughs> so you saw Paranormal Activity in the theater, so you saw the theatrical ending, where he goes flying at the camera and then you see the demon face. Yeah, I saw Paranormal Activity 2 in theaters. Oh, so you didn't see the first... But you saw that ending, is the point I'm making. Yeah, I've seen both endings. Okay, I stole my copy off the internet. So I got the ending where she's shot by the police, which is a completely different ending, and they wouldn't have been able to do the sequels with that ending. I like that ending better. Yeah, me too. In 2009, A Paranormal Activity was the big one. Then last year, the big ghost movie was Insidious. And it was sort of a similar level of success, because there was a lot of press about how Insidious was a $1 million movie, and it made its budget back tenfold. And I'm surprised they're not working on a sequel to this. I haven't heard anything about a sequel. It was only a $1 million movie? I don't know if I believe them because it had name actors like Patrick Wilson and Barbara Hershey in it so I don't know if I believe that it was a one million 
dollar movie, but that's what they said. Maybe they were friends that did it. I don't know. Possibly. So you've seen Insidious. Yes. And this is another movie that technically isn't a ghost movie. It's a demonic entity or whatever. But what are your thoughts on Insidious? It's the reappearance of Darth Maul. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was an interesting movie. And I don't mean, like, interesting as in, like, it kept me on the edge of my seat an interesting movie. Bore you to death. And it didn't you bore, it no, it didn't bore me to death. I would say it would be worth a Netflix rental. I'm not saying go out and spend an extra dollar to four dollars on a rental. Yeah, don't buy the Blu-ray. Have Netflix. Get on your Netflix and see you. It's worth a pickup. This kid is a medium. Like, it's Poltergeist and The Shining and all those movies where the kids have psychic powers and that draws bad things to them. It's kind of like a Poltergeist remake, really. It has a lot in common, yes. That's about all I can say about it. It's one of those interesting movies. Yeah. And when you think the movie's over, it throws one more thing at you. Mm. Well, the, my problem with Insidious, I kind of like the movie, but I had a similar experience with this that I have with a lot of mainstream studio horror, is there are elements that work, there are very effective, creepy scenes in this movie. There's the seance scene. That, Which is wearing a gas mask. Yeah, that's... That is pretty creepy. That's that kind of creepy. There's a scene where Barbara Hershey talks about the shadow in the bedroom. And honestly, I kind of liked Darth Maul. I thought he was actually sort of weird looking. Sort of creepy looking. Well, yeah, I mean, I, that's just the best way to describe it is it's Darth Maul. But the for, tale. for every sequence that's effective like that... There's two that aren't? Yeah, there's something like a little kid running through the hallways for no reason. Or especially at the end of the movie where the father goes into the spirit realm and he's fighting shuddering, jittery goth zombies. As somebody who loves the music of Tiny Tim, I personally don't find Tiptoe Through the Tulips to be a sinister song. I thought it was actually kind of funny that they were using that and thought it was supposed to be scary. And I hated the ending. I hate I hate that stupid, unnecessary twist ending. It was just bullshit. Yeah, I'll give you that. It's bullshit. But the film has some effective moments, has, but it also has some really annoying, cliched, unnecessary moments. So I don't know. I wasn't as blown away by Insidious like a lot of people were, but it was a good try. I'll give them that. And that ends our formal list. However, there's a movie from 1992 that I am dying to see, and I have not seen it, but it's called Ghost Watch. And that... Ghost Watch. No, it's called Ghost Watch, and this was a this was sort of a precursor to Paranormal Activity in a lot of ways. It was a BBC production, and it was for television. However, they made it look like a real news broadcast, and they did this by using real news personalities from the time and treating it as, for all intents and purposes, it was a real thing. Even though there were disclaimers at the beginning that said this is a fictional program and credits at the end, stuff like that, it sent people in Britain into a panic. There were all sorts of calls and complaints to the BBC and children were going to shrinks and stuff. Now, it was kind of a smaller event, what happened with Orson Welles' War of the Worlds broadcast in the 50s. And that sounds interesting to me, and I'm sure it has to be on the internet. You can't get it on DVD here, but it has to be somewhere on YouTube or something. I say that, but because it's British, it will probably suck. The British idea of horror is just kind of boring to me. Sorry. No offense. I love hammer horror, but anytime British filmmakers try to do, like, serious horror... As I said at the beginning of the episode, there's a continuing interest in Ghost as a horror concept. There are new films coming out all year. Just last episode, I was talking about The Innkeepers. There is a new film that's being set up to be this year's Insidious called Sinister. The Insidious 2? No, it's not, but it's... Um, is it Insidious Part 2? It's kind of a combination of a traditional haunted house movie and a found footage film and Ethan Hawke's in it. I haven't seen anything about it yet. No, Ethan Hawke's in it. It's going to suck. There's a movie called The Possession and The Apparition, and there's a movie called... I don't know what it's called, but but it's ghosts on a plane. Most of these films look terrible. However, the point I'm making is there's this continued interest in ghosts. Cable television is littered with ghost hunters, ghost hunters and ghosts. Paranormal activity. Par paranormal state. Paranormal state. state. It's an epidemic, and most of them are shit. I hate those shows. No, no, look at that warm spot on the wall. Ah! But they're popular. Like paranormal state. You can go on YouTube and type in ghost footage, and you'll get a hundred hits. Most of them are fake, obviously fake pranks. I I haven't seen one that convinced me. The point I'm making is there's this continued... Oh, that's because you're a non-believer. Do you believe in ghosts, J.D.? I do. Do you have any personal ghost anecdotes? <laughs> I have so many. It's more like, do I have any time that I haven't been around ghosts? <laughs> Remember how last year that old lady that used to live next to us died? I don't know if I told you that. I vaguely recall this. Okay. Well, she had this one certain perfume that she wore. The day that she was supposed to be buried, I was walking up my stair steps, and I got a whiff of perfume. Okay. And it was her perfume, and nobody else in our house wears that perfume. She's the 
only person I have ever known in my lifetime to wear that specific perfume. It hit me in the face like somebody had just sprayed it in my face. One time I was going up my stairs and happened to look to the corner of my eye and saw these red glowing eyes. Spooky. When I lived up at that trailer, I had a mirror on the wall. I'm sure I've told you this before. Mm-hmm. And it was like glued to the wall. Like we would tug on it and everything. And it would, it would sooner rip the wall off than it would come off. And then one day we were watching a horror movie or something and it just fell off the wall. One day I up at the trailer I heard stomping coming down the hallway and I was alone. So the point you're making is you've experienced a plethora of bizarre... Yeah. One time I took this picture and got a ghost cloud. Seriously. Really? And I lost the picture else I'd prove it to you but I really... They call those orbs, right? No, no, no. This was like a ghost cloud. A ghost cloud. (laughs) Yeah, like I would would describe it as slithering out of the ground. Weird. Weird. That's weird. I wouldn't say I'm a disbeliever. I have known many people who have personally encountered something they couldn't explain. Call it ghosts, whatever. I've never experienced anything. But people I trust, you among them, have experienced something. So I don't know if I believe in the concept of malevolent spirits. Does your rocking chair rock by itself? Used to. I never saw it. I don't know. So said my mother and my sister and my father. Well, three people can't be wrong. I'm open to the possibility that they could exist. I personally have never experienced anything, but I'm not denying it. I feel that way about pretty much most anomalous activity. Aliens exist, Zach. Get over it. I think aliens exist. I just don't know if they've ever visited this planet. I think they have. And on that spooky note, we will conclude the latest episode of the Bangers and Mash Show, unless there's anything else you want to share. No, I think that's the majority of the big ones. Okay. Oh, no, one time we stayed at the Hilltop House down at Harper's Ferry. Uh Somebody knocked on our door, and we opened the door, and there was nothing there. And there was nobody in the hallway. West Virginia and Virginia, we're right in the middle of Civil War country, so there's a lot of supposed historical hauntings in this area. Hey, viewers, if you have any ghost stories, personal experiences, and anecdotes, you would like to share with us feel free to comment on this video send us a it's a podcast i mean whatever i'm trying to make it interactive but you just have to be a dick about it well you're always a dick you're not allowed to be a dick once in a while anyway as always dick cloud as always i am mr bangers aka zach and this is my co-host mr mash aka jt and this has been the bangers and mash show hey man watch out look behind you Thank <laughs> you.